Okay, so for hand winding coils, uh, what I do is I belt a jig. And basically what that does is gives me something that holds my uh, spool of wire. Uh, I just buy a thousand foot spool. It's about a hundred bucks. You mount that up and what I did in this case is I took a couple of rubber door stops which wedge against the uh, wheel and that keeps constant tension on it. You can see the little slight bow. Uh, let's see. And basically this is takes a couple of at least a pound or so of pressure to pull that through. So then I put that over this and under this and now I have constant drag and that drag is going to keep everything tight. So then I have on my, uh, I don't have a bobbin. This is a T-top iron core. Put the washers on it, drill out the holes and super glue it into place. Okay, that then goes on to this. This little gadget here, I bought 20 bucks on eBay. You spin that on and that way when you do a forward wind, it will create a reverse. Okay, so find your inside hole. Feed that through, get that lined up, wrap your tension around to hold it. Once everything's lined up, basically, like I said, you crank this forward and it creates a reverse counterclockwise wind. You gotta always, the reason you gotta have this either you gotta have some kind of a tension device or drag to keep constant tension. This can never, once you get going, you cannot have slack pop up or else your winds will get loose. If they get any loose at all, the next layer will be allowed to push down in between the first two wires and then you'll have a, a divot, a valley, and every single row will be screwed up and get worse and worse. So every single wind has to be very, very tight. Okay, and once you get that started and you get everything in place, now this is 22 gauge wire. This is as thick as you want to go. I suggest you use 24 gauge because this is a little tricky and you have to constantly be correcting it. With 24 gauge, you'll just be able to just Okay, that's one layer. Next one, two down, three up, four up, five down, back and forth. That's one layer. Um, so basically with 22 gauge, I can do seven layers and it's the same as 10 layers with 24 gauge. Now, whenever I show you, uh, like in the video about how to ohm out the uh, coils that's based on standard 24 gauge wire. If you're using 26 gauge wire, the thinner the wire, the more the resistance, and those numbers will go up. If you're using aluminum wire, then they will go the resistance is greater and the numbers will go up even more. So, those numbers, if you have five or more on your ohms, you either have 26 gauge wire and or aluminum wire instead of copper wire. I'm going to go show you uh, some of the finished stuff that I did. Okay, so here's some full size coils. You'll notice I didn't quite go very far down. Typically, you want to go as far down as you can so you can get as many wraps as you can. Uh, this, But like I said, this is 22 gauge wire, so I don't have to make it quite as big and I can still get the same power as of a tin layer from 24 gauge. Now if you're gonna make your own coils, like I said, uh, my total cost was about a hundred bucks for a thousand foot of wire and then another twenty for the the crank. So that hundred and twenty dollars will allow me to make probably I have no idea how many pairs I've already done, probably half a dozen and I've got way more to go. 
Um, these are some half stacks or stilted coils that are going to go on to my next side-by-side -side project. I didn't use them this time because I wasn't happy enough with the frame. But basically what I do is I, well I'm not going to explain to you everything I do with my 22 gauge wire. That's a bit of a secret. Just use a 24 gauge. The reason I don't use 26 gauge like a lot of Chinese machines is because if you've ever taken machines apart and then put them back together it's uh, pretty common to snap the wire from underneath the base just from wiggling it back and forth a few times it'll pop off and then it's ruined. So 26 is way too thin. Like I said it also gives you too much resistance the thinner the wire is and the longer you, more uh, layers you have to use. So really it's best to always just stick to 24. It gives you uh, the strength and also the ease of winding the coil. Now like I said, I'm going to show you some things. Uh, number one, this is just going to be quick. I threw this together in about five minutes, literally. Just Okay, and all I wanted to show you was, I wanted to speak about how the entire design of a two-layer inline coil is really, it's just pointless. If you notice, uh, your rear coil where it sets, and sometimes it's closer to the spring deck than others, but depending on what this distance is from the top to here, where your top coil is, where it's pulling at, that resistance made by the rear spring, in this case, your rear spring, your uh, rear coil is so close to the spring deck, it's almost 100% resistance. Whereas when you're pulling from out front, it's less resistance, which is why you jump on the long end of the damn diving board and not where it's bolted down at because it doesn't move. So this rear coil is pulling against like 90% pure resistance. So really the rear coil is obsolete because it does so little work. It can only do so much work because it's placed so close to the spring deck and it has so much resistance. Now a, if you take out your rear coil, leave the front coil you don't need that second post um, some people will call you know it's called a ghost coil usually you'll see people that wind a really big fat front coil and then they'll put like a bar or something in the back what you know might be called a ghost coil I'm not quite sure what that point is because I think it goes back to the idea that what the machine uses is an electromagnetic horseshoe uh, magnet but in reality it's not because both coils are wound counterclockwise and the winding of your coil directs the flow of the energy in the direction of the pull with it wound counterclockwise using the left hand roll your pull is going to go down north to south so it will always pull this way so both of them are pulling down it's not as if you create a horseshoe magnet with this it's pointless because of all the resistance in the rear you'll never get it to run with just the rear power you have out front at the point of least resistance the easier the machine is going to run now the only other thing um, about making your coil the most efficient that you can has to do with the size of the attracting surface. Now your standard coil uh, like this will be 5 sixteenths. It's gonna get that angle. Okay so there's your standard coil and your standard armature bar. Now if you're doing something small that's great. If you're gonna try and do a single coil um, to make it more efficient you can go with more attracting surface area. Uh, you they have bigger cores, but then the bigger the core, the less area you have for putting on layers with, say, a 24 gauge wire. Uh, you're not going to get 10 to 12 if you've got a batter core. So that's why they make the T-tops. So that your attracting surface on the top is much bigger and you still have room for the extra layer or so of wire. Then you have wider armature bars. That wider surface attracting to the wider surface makes it more efficient. 
as opposed to that. Now, that's still going to work. It's just I'm talking about making it more efficient, perhaps if you're going to go with a single coil. That's the only other way to make uh, everything more efficient is larger tracking surfaces. If you have something like an armature bar that's wider and you want to lighten it up, then of course you just gut it out with a, a Dremel, hack it up, remove some metal, but keep your bottom surface as wide as possible. Uh, other than that, uh, that's pretty much it. I'm going to show you what I've done with some of my new builds now.